our uh, next speaker, William Kennedy, and he's the speaker just before tea. But I can tell you one thing, that he is going to be as enthusiastic, and he's going to ensure that you actually enjoy your tea. Tiffany's already done a lot of introductions of Bill in her, in her presentation itself, but uh, he's an all-around nice guy with a cool hat. <laughs> and he's, uh, he is the author of uh, Go In Action. And let's see Bill in action. Hey, everybody. How's it going? I, as usual, I got too much to say and not enough time to say it. So we're going to move really, really quick. All right. How many people are actually working on projects here day in and day out, full time? Man, those lights are too large. Full time. Let me see some hands here. Okay, brilliant. Now, for the rest of you, this talk is really about the struggles I see too many people having when trying to start their first projects in Go. It can get a little complicated in the beginning because Go, even though you know the language, you know the syntax, you can pick that up quickly, how you organize and structure your projects can sometimes be confusing. But I want to start with this quote. In the year 2000, this gentleman right here asked Brian Kernahan a question. Can you tell us about the worst features of C? Now, it says a lot here, but basically what Brian said is three really important things about that. One, that the various pieces of the program, trying to keep them apart, was hard in C because the compiler, the language, wasn't giving us any help. You could simulate object-oriented programming all you wanted, but the language and the compiler wasn't giving us any help. That there were no way of creating firewalls within, within the structure. And when you start thinking about this idea of packaging in Go, I think this is where it stems from, that packages give us the ability to create these firewalls within our Go programs. So we can keep those various pieces apart. It's going to make it easier to have large projects working on large teams. But most important, the compiler and the language is there to help us. I always like to talk about language mechanics before we start talking about design, because I think it helps to have an understanding of how things work. And then we can apply design philosophies around them. So here's one. Packaging directly conflicts with how we've been taught to organize source code. This is the, one of the biggest things that I see. I mean, we've been taught, hey, you're going to organize some source code, maybe a class here and there, throw it into a folder. But if you start doing that in Go, eventually what's going to happen is you're going to create these situations where as the project gets larger, it just gets more difficult to use and scale. Now, what we have to think about is that every folder in Go isn't a place to organize source code. What we're doing is organizing our APIs. Because in Go, every package is that folder of source code. And what happens is every one of those folders, every package is built into a static standard library at the end of the day. That's what we're building. And so when we start trying to organize our source code, I don't want to think about it in terms of the code itself. I'm always thinking about what component do I need for that? What component do I need for this? What component do I need for that? And I start organizing the project based on those components. You see, in other languages, the idea of packaging, the idea of creating state libraries is not built into the language. It's, it's done through the tooling. So you can choose to do that, or you can choose to ignore it. But in Go, it's foundation. It's part of the language itself. And we have to be sympathetic with it. What I really like to think about is this idea of packaging as creating a set of like microservices across your entire project. Think about it. If you think about your entire source graph, right, your, your, your source tree of folders, and you think about each one being like a microservice with this idea that they're separated, Man, that's really interesting. Because in other languages, we can almost consider the entire source tree for a project a monolithic application, couldn't we? And so here's Go promoting this idea of what? Almost microservices at the source code level, at the project level. All right, 
But what gets interesting is sometimes I hear the word sub-packages. See, in Go, all packages are first class. The, any structure that you see is of your own device because you're trying to organize your components. But at the end of the day, the compiler is going to build these static libraries, and they're all going to be flattened out and then put back together. Now, given that a package creates a firewall, we've got to have a way of opening up a package so others outside of it can use it. And that's where we get into the concepts of what? Exporting and unexporting. Getting identifiers, making them available outside of the package for use. And that exported identifier becomes part of our what? Public API. And we have to think really carefully about those things that we export. One really interesting feature that I hear people complain about, I call it a feature, is two packages cannot import each other. There's no cross-importing. Now you might say, what's going on here? And you may hear that, you know, we did that to help speed up compile times, which is an important part of Go. But I think what's even more important is that this feature requires you to start thinking about what you're doing, thinking about the APIs you're building, thinking about the relationships of those APIs. This is really a feature that makes you slow down and think. I hate the idea of patterns. I hate the idea of frameworks because these things don't allow you to think. I love design. Design allows you to take any situation you're in at any given time and identify an answer. It's not about right or wrong. It's about cost trade-offs at that moment in time. And packaging does this. Now that we've seen some of the mechanics around packaging, right, the firewall, we can start talking a little bit about design. There's three pieces to design when it comes to packaging. There's purpose, there's going to be usability, okay, and then there's going to be portability. Let's talk about purpose. Now we're talking about design. How do we design packages? What should we have in our head when we begin to think about design? Now, for a package to be purposeful, it must provide and not contain. What do I mean by that? What I mean is, is that every package should have a purpose. What does this package do? And its name should be very specific to that. If you can't come up with a name for your package, that's a smell. If you can't tell me what does this package provide as it relates to the project that we're working on, that's a smell. Contain means that you've got a package that just has this, this fragmented set of code. When you have that, two really bad things happen. You've got a package that most likely many other packages are dependent on. And that starts to create really bad cascading effects throughout your project. Eventually, your projects will get large enough where you're going to want to split some things up. And now you've got this parasite, basically, attached to everything. So packages like HTTP and FUMPT, those are great names. I.O., those are packages that provide. But if I see packages like util and helpers or, you know, common, that's a warning sign. That's a flag. We've got packages here that are containing. The package name must um, match the intent of what it provides. And I don't want these packages to become a dumping ground, all the things I just laid out. So that's purpose. Purpose is really important. It's how you start. You do a design on the whiteboard, and I want you to think about, we need to build this component that has this purpose. We need to build this package right here. It has this purpose. I like using the word component. Component and package are very much the same thing to me. Usability. Now, this is a tough one. For packages to be usable, they must be designed with the application developer in mind. This is critical. People are using your packages. How many of you have used an API in the past that made you so miserable you didn't want to go to work the next day? I can't raise enough hands and feet. You have the ability to make people happy and want to go to work or really sad and want to quit their jobs. Maybe even get out of tech. You really do have the power. I get crazy when I hear about write APIs that are testable. No, write APIs that are usable, and if they're not testable, that's a smell. I ain't writing code for tests. I'm writing code for him and you and you back there. So 
Obviously, they must be intuitive and simple to use. Use your unit tests to validate this. When I write a test, half that test is not just to validate the code is working as expected. It's to validate the API is intuitive and simple to use. This is a big one. You're writing packages that others are going to use in their application. You must respect the impact your package is going to have on resources and performance. I saw an API one time that I knew was not going to be good. I knew in a tight loop it was going to allocate quite a bit. And I asked the developer, what are you doing here? And his answer was, well, you know, the GC is really, really great, so don't worry about it. It's going to be taken care of. I really do have hair, but I'm starting to lose it because I pulled my hair out on that one. We can be smarter, but it's about respect. It's about respecting the people that have to use those APIs. Okay? This is the big one. We must design the APIs so when we want to make changes to it, it doesn't cause cascading changes all the way up. This is where the error interface is so brilliant. Frances talked about using that interface of timeout and temporary. Because what he's saying to you is, if you declare this behavior and your concrete error types implement this behavior, then users are doing error handling at the interface level, not at the concrete level. And now if you can improve those methods over time, the user takes advantage of it and nothing breaks. Using the error interface is really brilliant when it comes to this. And it goes back to, Anytime I see code that performs a type assertion, it raises a flag. Here we are, we've got an interface, man, we're getting decoupling going, and you go back to the concrete, you've just set yourself up for a cascading change. And when it's around error handling, it could be even worse. These are design philosophies, these are things I want you to have in your head as you begin to think about the design of your packages. Because if you do all of these little things and more, and we can reduce, minimize, and simplify the code base of every single package, you're going to get integrity. You really will. Less code means less chances for bugs and things hiding, and honestly, hacking. When a code base gets so large that it's unmanageable, you stop thinking about design, and you start trying to what? Just fix the current problem. Bad, bad stuff. OK, portability. For packages to be portable, they have to be designed with reusability in mind. This is a big one, but this one's a really hard one to figure out. We're going to talk about how you can apply these ideas of reusability in a second. But let's talk about portability first from a design perspective. You must aspire for your packages to have the highest level of portability for what their purpose is. You need to think about it. I want you to think of every package as that bottle of water on the table. You should be able to take this package, pick it up, and I don't care if you haven't finished your water yet, and put it down somewhere else. Every package should be almost as portable as that. If that's not in your head, you're going to have problems when the code gets larger, when your teams get larger, when things just get bigger. This is a big one. The more opinions a package forces on others, the less usable it can become. Think about it. If I'm writing packages that are supposed to be used for lots of different projects, and I've decided that I'm going to log in this package, and this is how I log, and the application developer doesn't want to log that way, can they use my package? No. I'm, in for I'm forcing an opinion on those who want to use this. And it's bad because that might have been a perfect package that they could have used. And now they can't. So we've got to think about the opinions that we're forcing on, on other developers, depending on how level of portability we need from that package. And this we talked about already. You don't want packages to become a single point of dependency. The worst situation I've seen over and over again is a package called common types. If you start creating packages of common types, this is where you're going. You might be thinking, well, Bill, I have all of this all these other packages that need these types, so we're going to do this. 
Over time, you're going to have the same problem. You're not going to be able to break it up. Well, Bill, what are you saying? I've got to duplicate types in different packages? Yeah, I think I am saying that. Because if this package has this purpose and this package has this purpose, that's the types are an artifact to the API, not, not the other way around. So we need to think about, to the level of reusability for that package, we might have to duplicate some types here and there. It's just part of, that, uh, uh, of getting the benefit. Remember, everything's about cost and benefit. Everything's about what benefit do we want and what cost we're going to take because nothing is free. Nothing is free. It's not about right or wrong. It's about what, we can, what we're going to live with to gain what we need. Okay. I'm now going to go into some package-oriented design. This is what I call um, being able to take these designs and now apply it to a project. I do a lot of business-level projects, a lot of CRUD, a lot of web services, CLI tooling. And over the last three years, I've tried different ways to organize these projects. But this is what package-oriented design is all about. It allows a developer to identify where a package belongs inside of a Go project. We're going to give you a, I'm going to give you a structure for what I think a Go project is, what it should be, and what I'm having success. Now understand this is just one structure. You can apply these design philosophies across different structures depending on the size of your particular project. I'm sharing with you how I'm organizing projects, how I'm doing things um, internally over at Arden and with clients. Um, Package-oriented design is going to help us define what a project is and how we structure that project. And finally, the whole purpose of this is about fostering communication around design. It's about getting the team to say yes or no or just to have the conversation. It's not about right or wrong. It's just about having the conversation to validate that what we're doing at all times today and for tomorrow seems reasonable and practical. Not right or wrong, reasonable and practical. So let's talk about the project structure. I think that every company, this is Bill Kennedy, every company should have a kit project. Now, I consider a kit project to be a single repo of code, of packages, hopefully highly reusable packages. So things like your log, your config, things like that, that many application projects are going to need, go into that kit repo. Now, I like having a single kit repo because I think it's easier to manage. But others like to break those kit packages up into separate repos. It's up to you. It's going to work the same. It de all depends on what you think is better for your situation and your company. Now, this would be a sample of a kit repo that I would have. This is my Arden Labs kit. You can see I've got packages like config and log and pool and TCP. And most of the projects that I work on will use web and config and log. But log and config don't import each other. That log package, if there needs to be configuration, it has to be part of the API. Same thing. None of these packages are allowed to log. They have to be as reusable and portable as possible. That's why they're here. I can't say that this team wants to do logging one way, this team wants to do logging a different way, and now they can't use the web package. Right? That's separation of concerns. I should be able to pick that up like a bottle. Now, this is how I structure my application projects. I believe that every application project should contain the group, the set of programs, web services, CLI tools, background programs that you deploy together as part of that solution. Most companies only need one application project. They have one platform that they're delivering. It doesn't mean that these things have to be always um, put into production at the same time. There are some larger companies that have different teams, and maybe you have a couple. That's up to you. But I want you to look at the structure. Command, internal, and vendor at the root. Sorry. Command is where all of the different binaries that you're building will sit. Internal will be all of the packages that you're building that are reusable across command. You might have multiple web services, and they need a package 
because they're providing business logic. That business logic package goes under internal. Why? Because we're reusing it across multiple command binaries. But if there's a package that's only for one command, should it go in internal? Probably not. It should be under command for that binary. See, package-oriented design is about identifying where this package lives because from that point, we can validate the design decisions for that package. And vendor is for all the third-party stuff, including your kit. If I bring any kit packages into this application project, they fall under vendor. For me, they're third-party. Now, the platform folder inside of internal, for me, it's like those kit packages, but internal just to the project. Things like for databases. Maybe you have your own logging system that could go there. So this is a really nice structure. It fosters conversations around, we need a component. What's its purpose? It's this. OK, where does it belong? Internal. Now we know how we have to design this thing. What's nice is an internal package one day might end up in your kit, because suddenly we realize that this package is usable across other applications. right? and we can refactor over time. So how do we validate these things across this particular project structure? OK. So I've got some notes here, just because there's just too many details around this. And I'd rather use the notes if that's OK. All right. The location of a, a, proj of, of a package. Now, when we're dealing with kit, I already said that these should be foundational packages that could be used across many application projects. All right? I've already said, here's a typical maybe uh, application project that you might have at the command level. You see there's two, two folders there under command. I use that D notation to denote that it's a web service. And the other one is probably a background process or a CLI tool. And you can see the packages under there are very, very, very specific to building out those things. Here's a typical internal. Attachments, locations, orders. Orders has these packages. I like using the source tree to represent the import relationships. This is what I like to do. And you can see that orders is importing customers in this particular case. But no packages at the same level are allowed to import each other. If somebody tries to have attachments import locations, that's a big, big flag. They have to stay decoupled. They are at the same level. Now we have to start having design conversations around APIs. If attachments needs location, then location probably should be placed under attachments. Or maybe locations isn't internal. Maybe it's really a command package for one particular binary, which means it's got much more flexibility in terms of what it can import. Do you see the conversations that we're having? Can there be exceptions to rules? Absolutely. But what I care about is identifying what this package's purpose is as it relates to the project, where it belongs as it relates to the project, and making sure, based on that, that it has the right level of portability all the way through. Internal, I said you might have packages like for databases, JSON encoding, crypto, things that multiple internal packages are going to need. Now, one reason I use the internal name here one reason I use internal is because you get an extra level of compiler protection here. The compiler will not let another project import an internal package here. How cool is that? I don't have to worry about another team finding this project and saying, hey, I really like that package there. I'm going to import it. Compiler won't let it happen. Only packages inside this project can import things from internal. How cool is that? We go back to the quote. It's about the language itself giving you support. The language. OK. So we talked about the location. I want to be able to validate dependencies. Now, for all packages, I don't care where they live. When I'm doing a code review, when we're doing design, I'm going to always validate every dependency that that package has up front. We're going to validate it, because every dependency means it becomes a little less reusable across the project. We might need to, we're going to need dependencies, but we want to validate them at all times and validate that they're accurate. I'm always going to question an import to another package if you're doing it just 
to gain access to that package's types. That's a big red flag. So I might ask you, why is this import here? What is the dependency? It looks like you just needed that type. Oh, you just needed that type? No, 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 we can't do this. You better really be able to prove that we can't make a copy of the types you need and keep these two packages more portable. I already said that packages should never be importing each other at the same level. OK, handlers and routes in this particular case, um, attachments and locations, they shouldn't be importing each other if you want to maintain the highest levels of, of, of portability. But if you decide that these two packages need, we're going to have those questions. We talked already about validating the opinions. So I already told you kit can't log. As far as I'm concerned, platform can't log either. But internal packages can log because they're part of a project. Opinions are at the project level. So packages inside of command, packages inside of internal, they can log all day long. Packages inside of kit, no. And packages inside of platform, I would question these packages if they're logging. I would hope one day that they could become kit packages one day. And if you move them to kit, now you've got to rip the logging out anyway. And logging is another conversation to have. But all right. This is a big one around API design for me. I want you to think about, think about this for a second. Every problem that we solve is a data transformation problem, correct? Every problem we solve is a data transformation problem. And our functions and methods accept input and produce some sort of output. So the input that we receive in our API is critical towards portability. Critical. All right? I always validate the semantics that are being used for the types, for the data. I want to make sure, are we using value semantics for the things that should be values and pointer semantics for the things that should be pointers? An example of that is the time package. If I'm passing time values around, we should be using value semantics. If I'm working with a file, we probably should be using pointer semantics. For the types that you're declaring, I want to make sure there's consistency. I don't want to see a mix of pointer receivers and value receivers. Should we be using one semantic or the other? These are things we're looking at and I'm reviewing when we look at API, um, APIs. Now, if you decide that this function or method is going to use an interface to accept data, I'm going to validate that you're accepting data through an interface because you need behavior, not because you need that data itself, because that's going to result in a type assertion, isn't it? So what behavior did you need that we're using this interface? That's what we're looking. Now, you might decide, no, 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 I don't need behavior. I really need the data. Now, I'm going to say, let's use a concrete type, preferably a concrete type from this package. But if you have dependencies that we've agreed are good and the types that we need already exist, should we be creating new types? <sighs> Probably not. But do you see the conversations that we're going to start having? We're really going to start thinking about what we're doing and why, instead of just doing it. And this is what's so important to me. D software development is not really about the code that you finally sit down and start writing. It's about this, design, architecture, cost, trade-off, having these conversations. So by the time your fingers are on the keyboard, you have a pretty good idea of what you're doing. You have a pretty good idea that at least we're going in a direction that everybody agrees with and is good for the project. Could we make mistakes? Absolutely. Can we refactor? Yeah, we can. Maybe not all in one time, but we can over time. And as a project grows, things are going to change, and we're going to have to refactor, and things are going to move, and that's OK. Somebody told me one time, you know, if you're refactoring, that means you've been making mistakes. Ah, oh, boy, did I want to cry. No, if you're refactoring, it's because you're learning, and now you can improve. I love refactoring. If I can refactor something every week, even if it's small, that's brilliant, right? Projects are never complete, though they are sometimes done. But refactoring is really important part of the life cycle of what we do. The last thing on this structure is error handling. And I'm, I've got a blog post coming out next month about logging and error handling. And I am a really big fan of Dave Cheney's um, wrapping package. But it has to be used correctly. 
These kit packages here can't be wrapping errors because then you're taking the opinion that all projects want to what? Wrap. Can't do it. These packages have to return root error values. But if we go back into this structure, well, command is the app. They, they get to make all the decisions around what? Opinions for this project. They can absolutely wrap. But most of these packages are going to be logging errors anyway. Internal, it can log. But most of these packages are probably not going to be handling the error. Handling the error means we're done. We've either logged it, we've dealt with it, it's not going back up the call stack anymore. Most of these packages are probably not handling errors. Most of these packages are. This is at the top of the food chain. And I really don't want to see these packages logging. I'd even prefer these packages don't even wrap errors. I consider these packages to be kit related, but internal to the project. I'd rather see these packages return root error values because I really would love to see these packages move to kit one day. And these packages here could technically, maybe if you're lucky enough, move to platform one day. How great would that be? We're starting to see things that are more reusable than we thought originally. So package-oriented design is about taking these design guidelines that we have as a community. That was the first part of this talk. Things that you hear all the time, but they're really hard to apply. What I've learned over the last three years is, if you create a project structure, a project structure, then you can start having conversations about design, constraints, and where things belong as it relates to the project. Like I said, this is one of many project structures that you could potentially come up with. If you're having conversations, that's all I care about. If you're able to apply those design guidelines in a way where it's conscious, it's not just a hack, that's all I care about. I want everybody to start thinking about what they're doing and not just go hack and do it. All right, thank you. All right, thank you, Bill. We have time for questions. All right, coming through. Bill, a host of questions coming your way. Let's do this with questions, just because I think we're running up yeah. time. Find me, find me at a break. Who's talking? Find me at a break, and then I'll answer any questions you have, okay? okay. Find me at a break. Find okay. me at a break. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, right. Bill.